Section 2. Questions? Concerns? All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. Arthur Schopenhauer We've spent some time talking about exactly how a resource-based economy might work, and we've discussed some of the positive changes it would be able to bring for our species. However, there are a number of potential issues that might be taken against the RBE concept. Many of these are objections that have popped up throughout the internet in response to the RBE idea. Although some of them are quickly revealed to be knee-jerk reactions based on superficial evaluations of the idea, many of them are honest, well-thought-out questions that need to be addressed. A few of them are questions that I have been asked personally while talking about the RBE idea in casual conversation. Before we begin talking about how we could go about testing an RBE, I'll attempt to answer as many of these queries and objections as I can think of. Here we go. What if someone wants more than they need? For example, what if someone wants 150 pairs of shoes, or a 5,000 square foot home all for themselves? Forget about human needs, aren't human wants infinite? This is essentially a question of values, and addressing it requires us to answer three questions, why do people value material things so much? What is so wrong about wanting lots of things? How do we change people's values so that this kind of dilemma doesn't come up in an RBE? The first question addresses the basic value set that defines life in a capitalist society, why do people love material things so much? Many people derive a huge amount of pleasure from buying things and owning things. There is a term that describes actions from which people derive massive amounts of pleasure, even if that action provides no physiological benefit. Addiction. An addiction is best characterized as a hijacking of the reward pathways in the brain, wherein someone experiences an action as being so rewarding that they are unable to stop performing it, even if it provides no benefit, or is actually harmful. On the one hand, the body derives pleasure from jogging because it increases physical fitness. People derive pleasure from spending time with friends and family because it fulfills our basic human need to socialize. On the other hand, some people derive massive pleasure from the act of shopping, even to the point of not being able to fully control themselves when on a shopping spree. This is in spite of the fact that this action, and almost always, the items being bought, have no real benefit for the mind or body. This is very much characteristic of an addiction. In this regard, a shopping mall is fundamentally identical to a crack house. The only difference is that one is more socially acceptable to enter than the other. Furthermore, we often have a tendency to think that our worth as a human being is measured according to the number and quality of things we possess. In fact, from the day we are born, we are taught that this is the case. Whether it is through advertising, the various holidays which have been reduced to gift buying orgies, or through the stress and trauma induced by this society which encourages addictive behavior, we are constantly reminded that we are only loved and respected based upon our ability to accumulate and display our material wealth. I myself have not been immune to this addiction. As a child and teenager, I was obsessed with various collections, which I protected as if they were my children. No matter how large any collection was, and no matter how much money I spent on them, it was never enough, I always wanted more. During my university days, I was well on my way to becoming a typical materialistic elitist, attempting to display my social status through expensive clothing and an attitude of superiority. Although I was eventually able to outgrow these addictions, many people never do outgrow them. Instead, they will continue to be trapped in a vicious cycle, making a purchase then experiencing great happiness for all of five minutes before their attention turns to the next thing they need to buy. For people trapped in this cycle of fruitless purchasing, there is simply no such thing as enough, a strong indicator of a powerful addiction. So, to answer the first question, why do people value material things so much? In short, we live in a society which actively builds in us an irrational addiction to material things regardless of their usefulness. But is this really so bad? 
What exactly is so wrong about our society's addiction to materials? From the perspective of our capitalist economic system, this addiction is the best thing that could possibly happen. By ensuring that people have a constant need to buy and own more things, we are better able to sustain economic growth. However, from the perspective of real life, this addiction is seriously damaging on a personal, social, and environmental level. It is personally damaging, in that we experience a great deal of stress when we do not possess an object of our desire, regardless of its usefulness, think back to all of the negative health effects of stress. A materialistic person will have a much more difficult time achieving lasting happiness, because there are always more things to accumulate, as soon as the thrill of obtaining the last item wears off, the happiness derived from it goes away too. The inability to achieve lasting happiness is seriously detrimental to one's overall health. The addiction is solely damaging, in that massive amounts of slave labor, mostly child slavery, in developing countries is required to feed our appetite for things here in the developed world. Even in an RBE, it would still be socially damaging, in that the resources spent feeding one person's addiction would mean that those resources cannot be used for something more objectively useful. In addition, one might expect to face some degree of social ostracism for using resources in such an irresponsible way, especially considering the relatively high amount of convenience and luxury that can be achieved while remaining sustainable. Lastly, the addiction is environmentally damaging, in that our insatiable need for things requires the expenditure of vast amounts of resources at a rate that is faster than what is sustainable. To make matters worse, High amounts of consumption also mean high amounts of waste, as indicated by the landfills and dumping sites that now cover much of the globe. So, why is our addiction to material things worth getting rid of? Simply put, it is a losing situation for almost everyone and everything on the planet. So, how would we avoid this addiction in an RBE? For individuals born into that society, the answer is quite simple. Without the societal pressures that build a materialistic addiction in us, there would be no reason for it to manifest. Remember, and we would have no advertising, no forces encouraging materialism, and would be a far less stressful and traumatic society. Furthermore, it would be a society in which people are educated to think about how their actions will affect society and the planet. Obviously, the mass accumulation of things is not really of benefit to anyone. Basically, an RBE is an environment that fosters the opposite of materialism. It is an environment in which people are taught that every human life is worthwhile regardless of material possessions, people are educated to be more socially responsible, and positive contributions to society are what is valued. However, this still does not answer the question of how we actually go about changing the values of those people alive today. Unfortunately, like any addiction, the healing process cannot begin until the addict admits that they have a problem. Stop and think for a moment about the materialistic addiction as I described it above and like your life. Might you be addicted to things? Many people will probably deny this, citing excuses such as, I like to shop because it relieves stress. I should point out that feeding an addiction is often a great way to temporarily relieve stress. Others might say, I need all of these things to live. Objectively speaking, this is absolutely not true. Denial is very much characteristic of an addiction. And of course, the classic, I earned all of these things. Who are you to tell me I'm wrong for wanting them? There may be some truth to this assertion, and I should stress once again that I am not here to pass judgment on what is right or wrong. But I would have to respond to this with two questions of my own even if you did earn them, which, as we'll discuss soon, is not always the case, are all of these inanimate objects actually doing you any objective good? Also, is your material success worth all of the negative personal, social, and environmental consequences? I cannot answer these questions for you, and I honestly don't expect anyone to completely change their values based on reading a few paragraphs in some book. However, what I do hope is that this will at least get people thinking more about the impact of their actions, and the benefits and drawbacks of their values.
Sometimes, all it takes is the honest asking of a single question to completely change the course of a person's life. This is ultimately the single most difficult aspect of transitioning to an RBE, even if we have all of the technical aspects of this system described and planned out perfectly, we would still need for the whole of the planet to voluntarily change their values. Instead of our values being dominated by materialism and greed, we would need everyone to begin valuing sustainability and cooperation. How can we possibly hope to accomplish such a lofty goal? There are basically three major steps that need to be taken in order to this, 1. We first need to convince people that the concept of an RBE is actually technically possible, and would improve our standard of living. This is the primary purpose of section 1 and section 2, so we are already making progress on this front. By giving people a concrete idea of what this potential future would be like, we are much more likely to convince people that it would be worth pursuing. And, at the individual level, the pursuit of an RBE begins entirely with a change in one's values. 2. The actual transition needs to be a gradual one. Despite the clear failings of capitalism, we cannot expect that people will just suddenly decide to change everything that they value. Likewise, we cannot suddenly change our global society and expect that the process will go smoothly. In the same way that environmental changes need to occur at a rate which the surrounding plants and animals can keep up with, this massive shift in the way we live must occur at a rate which our species is comfortable with. We need to give our species adequate time to allow for the necessary shift in values to occur. That amount of time will be discussed in section 3. 3. We need a working example of a community based on the principles of an RBE. No matter how good this idea sounds in theory, we need to have a working example that actually shows people how much better their lives would be. In this way, we would actually inspire people to want to change themselves, rather than just telling them that change would be a good idea. This would also have the benefit of greatly reducing the necessary transition time required for our society to adapt to this new idea, if people can see the benefit of this new value system they would be much more likely to accept it, and want to change their own values. As you'll see in the next section, the creation of one or more example communities is a critical aspect of the proposed plan for testing this system. Insert Economist here, has already proven that this idea cannot work. This assertion is based on the work of early 20th century economists, and essentially takes the form of two problems, the economic calculation problem and specific critiques against information processing in a centrally planned economy. The first problem goes something like this, an economic system without price would not work. Because there would be no way to set a value for goods and services. How then, could we possibly figure out a rational way to allocate them? This conundrum is called the economic calculation problem, and at first glance, this logic actually seems quite sound. However, this assertion makes the daring assumption that the market actually allocates resources in a rational way, an assumption that is difficult to defend when one looks at the world that this method of distribution has created, where two identical articles of clothing can have wildly different prices just because one has a brand name label on it, and a small portion of the population controls a huge percentage of the planet's resources. Whether such a method of distributing resources is rational is seriously questionable, but I won't linger on this question any longer for a very important reason, the ability to assign prices to goods and services loses any and all meaning in a post-scarcity economy. We can think of it in terms of the law of supply and demand. This economic rule dictates that as the supply of a good or service increases, the price for it must drop. Likewise, as demand for something decreases, the 